everyone, welcome to Science Friday. Here are some for E as well. The one on the top here is one of the ways that you can define E. What makes a field more likely to have an unbalanced gender distribution? So this can be like, in the case of this paper, gyrification or brain folds. A neuroscientist started to look at the brain of uh, like the and and more as I'm a senior and I'm focusing on the impact of US trade and financial sanctions on Iran. Um, I'm pretty interested in international relations, politics, international systems, as anyone who knows me probably knows. So that's kind of what drew me to this topic. And yeah, here's my presentation. Um, so I first just want to talk a little about the relevance of sanctions. US foreign policy has increasingly, increasingly used to achieve its objectives, particularly in the Persian Gulf, which is where two-thirds of U.S. imported oil and gas Iran is, the Pers is in within the Persian Gulf, for those of you who don't know. And then sanctions were first implemented in Iran in 1979, following the Iranian Revolution. And since then, and before that, they've been used in a range of other countries, um, North Korea, Russia, Venezuela, I'm sure you've seen more in the news. So they are a pretty, pretty predominant tool, which begs the question, are sanctions actually effective? Do they just wreak havoc on civilian populations without inducing the policy changes they are meant to? So the big question that we're going to be investigating here with the study I looked at is are U.S. trade and financial sanctions specifically on Iran effective? So just a little bit of historical context. Here are a couple of the main events you'll need to know um, to understand some of the background behind these sanctions. Um, before the Iranian Revolution in 1979, Iran was a major trading partner of the U.S. They had a lot better relations than they do today. 1979 saw the hostage crisis in which a bunch of Americans were taken hostage in the Iranian Revolution. And then sanctions were imposed by then President Jimmy Carter. 1980 saw the complete breakdown of diplomatic relations between the two countries. And then here it's a little bit smaller. 1995, then President Bill Clinton also tightened these sanctions by imposing a full trade and investment embargo. So the ally reactions here are a really important thing because they hugely changed how the efficacy of the sanctions worked. First of all, although U.S. was boycotting the purchase of Iranian oil, other countries did not. And this is pretty important because oil is a fungible commodity, which means it's interchangeable. Just because the U.S. isn't buying Iranian oil, Iran can just sell its oil to another country. So that changes the effect a lot. Uh, in 1995, it, the U.S. implemented a full embargo, but its allies still did not join. Instead, the European Union and other U.S. allies imposed something called the Critical Dialogue Policy, in which they rhetorically condemned the actions of the Iranian regime, but maintained diplomatic and trade relations. Um, because of that, the U.S. retaliated by imposing the ILSA, or Iran-Libya Sanctions Act, in which they essentially penalized any foreign persons who ex exported to Iran. So, just a little map here for reference. Um, so there are a couple of existing studies on sanctions in Iran specifically and whether they're effective. They've all kind of come to varying conclusions, as you can see. Um, but what's different about the study I looked at and also why it's being presented at Science Friday is that it's a very database approach that analyzes the efficacy of sanctions by compiling economic methods to quantify. <clears throat> okay, so first we're going to be looking at the impact of trade sanctions, later the impact of financial sanctions, adding them up, and then talking about what that means for Iran. So basically, the study used something called the welfare loss method, which finds a number called the sanction multiplier, which is essentially the ratio of the absolute change in economic welfare, aka consumer surplus, to corresponding absolute change in value of trade. Um, there's a specific equation for this. If you're interested in the math, I can send you this presentation after as well. But that's the summary. Um, on this graph, you'll see a couple key dates in U.S.-Iran relations. Over here, 1970. That's, the ho that's when the hostage crisis and Iranian revolution occurs. So you can see that you can see Iran drop off sharply. And you can see in 1991, the U.S. isn't importing much from Iran either because Iran imposes its own embargo on the U.S. So we're first going to be looking at the impact of U.S. export sanctions. The key part here is the concept of elasticity in economics which measures how supply and demand changes as price changes. If a good is elastic, that means that supply and demand will change as price changes, whereas if it's inelastic, supply and demand remains the same no matter what the price is, whether that drops super high or super low. Um, so U.S. exports to Iran were usually essential. Think machinery, electronics, which means that they are inelastic. 
Iranian demand was also quite inelastic, and the US supply ended up being inelastic in the short run, meaning it remained the same, but it became gradually elastic and responded to changes in price. All this information, coupled with the equation on the previous side, slide gives us a welfare loss of $82.25 million. Next, we're going to be looking at the impact of non-oil import sanctions. It's really hard to say how much oil Iran could have imported to the U.S. in the absence of, absence of sanctions, but the way we're, sorry, how much non-oil products they could have exported. But we're assuming that um, just based on the economic sizes at the time, the export would have been roughly 232 million, which is similar to Germany's. Um, and because the Iranian export supply for luxury goods was inelastic in the short run, it ends up being elastic in the long run. So that means that the supply and demand does change and respond to differing prices in the long run, although not in the short run. Anyway, we end up getting a welfare, welfare loss of $58 million. So looking at the impact of oil import sanctions, in my opinion, is probably one of the most interesting things to look at here. A really key thing here is that, like we talked about before, oil is a fungible commodity. It's interchangeable. That means that Iran can find new oil buyers, but it's kind of more of a pain for the U.S. because they have to find new o suppliers. This explains why an oil embargo by just the U.S. ends up being ineffective because OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, kind of follows this thing called the price leadership model. They have a dominant firm that basically sets a price for oil, and all of the other countries in OPEC just follow that price. So we can assume Saudi Arabia is the price leader here. Saudi Arabia says, okay, everyone, we're selling oil at this price. Every country in OPEC sells oil at that price, and then the price doesn't actually change, so Iran doesn't really lose anything from this. That gives us a welfare loss of zero dollars, meaning the oil embargo in Iran didn't really do anything at all. And when we add up all of the millions of dollars I talked about before, talked about before, we get a total number of $140 million. Okay, next we're going to be looking at the impact of financial sanctions, and we'll loop bad back to the trade sanctions aspect in a bit. So just to give you some background on financial sanctions, people generally aren't as familiar with those, it's basically the U.S. was able to weaken Iran's financial ability and force alternative financing through that. They basically ruined Iran's credibility in markets like the World Bank, International Development Association, IMF, etc., um, and just deprived Iran from financing in general. Capital is really important for Iran because the oil sector is super capital intensive. You need a lot of people to invest in it to actually get any money out of it. And the, and the ILSA, which we talked about earlier, prohibited U.S. investments in Iran's oil projects. This means that other foreign people can invest in Iran's projects, but the fact that the entire U.S. market for those investments was gone meant Iran had to turn to this thing called buyback contracts to boost production, which resulted in way less competitive terms for Iran, and they did not make as much money as they could have if, the, if ILSA hadn't been implemented. You can kind of see here a couple of the buyback contracts, and you can see how those change over time. And then um, we look at the bottom number of total value, and you're welcome to look more at this later um, when I show the slideshow, but we can see that there were a lot less competitive terms for Iran because of the implementation of those buyback contracts. Okay, so in terms of calculating the cost of financial sanctions, it's obviously pretty difficult to get an exact number for how much a poor investment environment damages the Iranian economy. The way we're roughly approximating it is the excess finance charges and buyback contracts added to the extra charges paid from the foreign debt balance. So we're going to unpack that a little more soon. Basically, in all of these international financial institutions that were on a previous slide, Iran had to pay more interest because of their lower debt rating and lower international standing. When we add up the sum of all those extra interest charges, we get $85 million per year. Next, we can calculate the cost of financial sanctions by looking at other, the lost profit from other oil things Iran was not able to engage in. Um, there's something called the Caspian oil swap, where oil would be pumped through pipelines to the Caspian Sea, but because of all the sanctions the U.S. implemented, international oil companies were no longer able to swap oil or pass oil through those pipelines. There were also a couple other proposed pipelines, although the Caspian oil swap was the largest. That means Iran lost a bunch of potential profit. You can, the study did the math on how many barrels would have been transported and the cost per barrel, and that ends up giving us a $286 million per year cost. So that gives us a $637 million cost for financial sanctions, which you may recall is a lot higher than the trade sanctions, but the total would be $777 million per year in terms of cost on Iran. That's about $12.10 per person in Iran, and about a, a little bit more than 1% of Iran's GDP in 2000. 
so you can see kind of here how the study that I am presenting on here compares to previous studies where they were looking at other instances. It generally approximates economic damage on Iran as being a lot higher than previously did. Okay, the next thing we're going to look at is why all of this is relevant and take a look at the efficacy of sanctions on Iran. So economic effect is in the short term defined as when sanctions economically affect the, par the party that the sanctions are being placed on, so in this case Iran, but don't cause significant damage to the party imposing the sanctions, which in this case would be the United States. That definitely applies here, so we can definitely analyze these sanctions as economically effective, especially because in the short term they really did have a huge disruption in Iran's oil export and its volatility in the foreign exchange market. However, there were pretty mil minimal long-term effects, which we're going to talk about more later. Iran's economy, because of those concepts of, of elasticity, was essentially able to bounce back after some time. In terms of the political effect on Iran, um, in a lot of ways these sanctions were ineffective. The EU continued to pursue its policy of critical dialogue that I mentioned earlier. Opposition within Iran were still vocal. Um, and the U.S. did invade Afghanistan and Iraq, which ruined, like, econ which ruined the perception of the U.S. within Iran. Um, however, terrorism rates de did decrease after the imposition of sanctions. Um, there was a bit of progress on nuclear technology, which we're going to be talking about more soon, the Iran nuclear deal, and not a ton of progress on human rights. Middle East peace process is debatable, depending on who you ask. Um, so a couple of the big takeaways from what we've talked about so far. One of the biggest is the size of both countries' economies plays a huge role in whether sanctions are effective, especially whether one country is dependent on the other. In this case, Iran was dependent on the U.S., but not vice versa, so it did end up having significant economic effects on Iran in the short term. In addition, the length of time sanctions were imposed play a huge difference. Because elasticities are higher in the long run, short-term effects are a lot more severe than long-term effects, which kind of shows a lot of interesting observations about the length of time sanctions have been imposed and whether sanctions efficacy decreases over time. So in terms of a couple of future U.S. policy considerations that these findings might suggest, first of all, financial sanctions were a lot more effective than trade sanctions. They made up roughly 70% of the total cost of sanctions, so those definitely caused the most damage. Um, second, unilateral import sanctions on crude oil are effective because of the concept of fungibility or interchangeability. Um, any other good that is also fungible, meaning it can just be replaced, would also be pretty ineffective if, if it's a unilateral ban, and you need allies to band together to impose an embargo for that to actually work. Um, it is pretty well agreed upon that the sanctions on Iran were a lot less politically damaging than U.S. military intervention would have been, and of course there were no American lives cost on the battlefield. There's a lot of controversy about Afghanistan, Iraq, not so much controversy in the news about Iranian sanctions, um, which kind of goes to show that political damage. Um, finally, political pressure might have been more effective in this case, like sanctions on specific individuals, which happens in the case of Russian oligarchs, for example, but obviously it is hard to definitively draw a conclusion from that. So overall, we can say that in the short term, Iran is economically damaged by U.S. sanctions, so those are economically effective in the short term, but ultimately U.S. sanctions don't induce significant policy change in Iran. Okay, that study was from 2005, so it has not been updated for a while, and obviously um, because of the nuclear de deal, there have been some significant changes since then, so I'm now going to be looking at a supplementary study that shows a couple similar findings. We can see on this graph how Iran's GDP growth rate changes based on that time between when the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, more commonly the Iran nuclear deal, was implemented, and May 2018 when the U.S. withdrew from the Iran nuclear deal. You can also see here at the same time period how Iran's total oil production changed, so that skyrocketed in the time of Iran, the Iran nuclear deal being implemented, and then after it was um, withdrawn from and U.S. sanctions were reinstated. GDP follows the same trend. Um, just to talk a little bit about the nuclear program, the heavy sanctions imposed on Iran from 2011 to 2015 are generally credited with Iran's willingness to accept that Iran nuclear deal. So those do play a pretty important role, and we can see that sanctions worked in incentivizing Iran in that case. Um, Joe Biden um, also used sanctions relief as an incentive for Iran in a couple different cases to get them back to the negotiating table, and that did end up working. So there's another place where sanctions have worked. Um, however, post-Iran nuclear deal, those sanctions were implemented as a replacement for the Iran nuclear deal, 
to disincentivize Iran from developing its military program. So those didn't actually prevent any nuclear development, which is interesting. Um, and Iran has continued to expand its missile capability over time. Um, in terms of how all of this affected Iran's regional influence and player as a player in the Middle East, it had a pretty minimal effect. Iran continued to engage in foreign intervention from 2011 to 2015, which is when those really heavy sanctions were there. And its defense programs have not slowed down since the tightening of sanctions in 2011. Um, in terms of political effects, Iranian hardliners overwhelmingly won the February 2020 political elections. Um, Iran continues to follow many of their policies. If you've seen the Masa Amini protest in the news recently, that's an example of that. Um, there have been a couple of economic effects where the sanctions have taken a toll. So pretty similar trends to the first study we looked at. Yeah, that is the overview. Are there